Um, Anila Angin did an Arabian Nights piece. Uh, you know, Tanya riffed on uh, Western fairy tales. And what I've got tonight is um, my attempt at a Malay fairy tale. Cyril wrote about the dragon prince. This is the crocodile prince. Chapter 1. The Sultana was proud. She had ruled her island for a dozen years, and in that brief span of time, she had made it glorious. She had built mighty citadels and thoroughfares, fragrant the pleasure gardens and mosques where her subjects might wander with bedazzled senses. She had chased out conquerors who had occupied her palace for generations, yet had done so with such cunning that they had vowed to remain her allies forever. Most importantly, she had won the love of her people. Where she walked, they scattered blossoms of jasmine and orchid. When she ate, they rushed to sample her curries to prove they were untainted by poison. True, she had her enemies, but they could cause little trouble locked up in her dungeons. They were crazed scholars and mountebanks, forgotten by all but their wives, who came each week to wail for them in their moonwhite veils. Yet if you ask the Sultana to name her greatest achievement, she would bow her graceful head and say, I thank God for the fortune I have had in the birth of my son. Her courtiers would smile at such motherly pride, yet they knew it was not misplaced. After all, the prince was a true gentleman, courteous in his manners, charming in his speech, and meticulous in his dress. His tutors reported him intelligent beyond his late years, and his ustas never failed to praise his high moral character. Other dynasties' offspring might go carousing and whoring in the night. This prince, however, was born to lead. Nonetheless, the Sultana worried. She had observed that her son had few friends and cared little for the world around him. He seemed content to cloister himself in the great libraries of the city, emerging only for prayers and food. Thus she resolved that on his 18th birthday, the prince would go into the jungle. This was a ritual followed by almost all the young men of the island, an initiation into the ways of the warrior, held amidst the sweltering rainforests of the north. Her courtiers lauded this ruling, for how could a prince be better trained to serve his subjects than by suffering their travails? And how should he learn to love his country but by sleeping with his face against its soil? Tongues wagged only in the marketplace, where old women gathered to barter cardamom for cumin. They knew the lore of the jungle and how hazardous it could be for an innocent prince. The boy could be in danger, they said, not only from tigers and guns and fire, but spirits. Nonetheless, when his 18th birthday came, the prince descended from his mother's carriage at the edge of the jungle, displaying neither fear nor consternation. The sultana had prepared herself for this moment and was about to counsel him with words of wisdom. Yet to her surprise, she found herself struck mute. Goodbye, mother, he told her. Sadly, he kissed her hands, then turned to join the throngs of young men disappearing into the woods, now lit by fireflies as the twilight dissolved into darkness. Chapter 2 After the departure of the prince, the sultana smiled bravely and returned to the palace. For the next few months, she busied herself with training her new vizier, meeting trade delegations, and disputing the best methods of dealing with piracy in the eastern seas. From time to time, however, she would confer with her spies. What they told her filled her heart with gladness. The prince was thriving in the wilderness, they said, as if by instinct he knew how to break the shell of the coconut to, <coughs> to drink its sweet water, how to trap and slaughter the python to dine on its fresh meat. <coughs> Other boys, even those who had grown up in the jungle's shadow, gazed in awe at his natural skill with the bow and arrow, the rifle and the kris. Yet the truth was that the prince was troubled. Each night, as his spies and sergeants slept, he lay awake in his tent, listening to the call of the crickets and cicadas. Strangely enough, he did not miss the palace, nor the city, nor the stacks of books in his room, which learned clerics had pressed into his hands. No, what troubled him was desire. Something had awakened in him that first night in the jungle, during the first rite of his initiation. By firelight, he and his newfound brothers had been ordered to strip off their garments so that they stood bare, royal and commoner alike, equal on the black, spongy earth. 
The hair had been shorn from their heads, so that their scalps resembled the skin of plucked chickens. Thereupon they were commanded to plunge into the western river to cleanse themselves. Bobbing breathless in the water, the prince was shocked by the sensation of another boy's bare flesh pressed against his own, by another boy's hands groping against his bones, by another boy's feet kicking at his feet. He rushed out of the river, shaking, into the clearing where bales of clothes and hair were being tossed into bonfires, bright sparks spiraling upwards into the night. From then on, the prince had cautiously avoided the communal baths. He chose instead to visit the river in the dead of the darkness, scrubbing the sweat and grime from his body until his skin felt as tender as a child's. He soon weighed the world, learned the way by touch, guided by memory, the moonlight and fireflies, so that he could leave and return to the camp without awaking the attention of the sentries who stood mourning at its gates. To comfort himself while bathing, he would chant songs to himself, half-remembered folk tunes his nursemaid had taught him, or religious melodies from the Izustas. This kept the darkness at bay and prevented his thoughts from turning to the ghostly tales the boys liked to exchange by lamplight, or worse, to the bodies of the boys themselves, which had so lately shared the same water that now immersed his body. Some nights, his mind played tricks on him. Where is he, my beloved kid goat, the one who eats yam leaves, he would murmur to himself, fingers rubbing the insides of his joints. Then out of the darkness, an echo voice seemed to reply, where is he, my heart, like a peeled egg? He did not, of course, believe in spirits. So this phantom voice did not frighten him. He knew it was a mere rustle of the reeds in the wind, or a half-forgotten memory, blending with the gurgle of the water. Yet he found himself growing oddly attached to this presence. On nights when the voice did not appear, he suffered from sharp pangs of loneliness that ate away at his insides. Some evenings, however, he would step into the water and hear it break into song at once, as if it had been waiting especially for him. Those nights, he found himself tossing fitfully on his bedroll, his skin trembling with a bewildering, tantalizing joy. It seemed only natural that the voice would one day begin to speak. Why do you come here alone? it said. I enjoy my solitude, the prince replied. He was not going to be honest immediately, not even to a disembodied voice. There was a pause. Then it spoke up again. I'll leave then. No, you misunderstand me. I appreciate your company. So I'm different? Yes. Why? This question perplexed the prince. Obviously it would not do to tell the voice it did not exist, so he chose to remain silent. Far from taking offense, the voice laughed. I imagine it's because you can't see me. Perhaps. And if you can't see me, I'm not real. Once again, silence. And if I'm not real, there's no harm if I do this. Suddenly, the prince felt pressure on his right breast, as if a leaf had drifted down the river and become stuck to his nipple. He moved his hand to peel the leaf away, but found it had come into contact with a body. It was a boy's body, warm and slender, but firm, with strong muscles in its chest and abdomen. It had hands, and they were holding him close. It had a cock, and was pressed against his own, hot against the chilly current of the river. The voice laughed again. Would you very mind very much if I kissed you? It said. The prince said nothing, and at that moment the sky opened with a crack of thunder, and it began to rain. Yet it was only an hour before daybreak when he stumbled back into camp, half delirious with pleasure, collapsing onto the bedroll of his tiny tent. Okay. There are like six chapters in this. I'm only going to read one more because I've been told I can't read the whole of it because then you wouldn't buy the book. <laughs>